welcome to this Green Alliance webinar. Really delighted that you uh, have joined us this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Venables. I'm Deputy Director of Politics and Partnerships at Green Alliance. Green Alliance is a um, independent environmental think tank, um, and we are focused on ambitious political leadership uh, for the environment. This is the third in our webinar series. Um, we're really trying this year to uh, narrate, um, explore and understand um, how the election, um, uh, the general election later this year, um, we'll hear from, uh, we'll be discussing the exact timing of that in the conversation, um, how the election uh, is interplaying with environmental issues. Um, I can say from my time working on climate and nature issues that, um, uh, from a decade ago, when it was hard to get a hearing, even for a, for for environmental issues, now it seems to be often the front page news in one way or another, uh, whether that's on heat pumps or electric vehicles or farming. Um, so uh, lots to talk about. Um, please do use the question and answer question and answer function. Um, we won't be looking too much at the chat, but I will try. Uh, but I'll definitely look at the question and answer function. Um, I'm really delighted uh, by the panellists that we've got today, um, and I'll introduce them shortly. Um, and just to say, this this webinar will last somewhere around 45 or 50 minutes. Um, so we'll hear from our three opening panellists and then from uh, a Green Alliance expert, Liam, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a short while. Um, yeah, I think that's all there is to, to say by way of opening. Um, so yeah, delighted to be able to introduce our panellists. Um, yeah, uh, we'll be hearing first from Lara Spirit, um, who is uh, the Red Box editor for The Times, um, which is a, a staple of uh, our political insight. Um, uh, in inboxes uh, across the UK, uh, and Lara uh, was um, uh, nominated in 2023 for Young Journalist of the Year by the Society of Editors. Um, so really delighted that Lara will be joining us, narrating some of the happenings, um, events and um, uh, drama of uh, Westminster. Also by Dara Viaz, who's the Deputy Chief Exec at Energy UK, which is the UK's leading trade body, uh, trade body for the energy industry. Dara is an amazing uh, expert uh, and source of wisdom and insight on all things uh, energy politics um, and previously worked for Systems Advice. Um, uh, so brings a real wealth of, uh, of, of experience on how uh, energy markets and policy um, impacts people. Uh, and finally, uh, Roger Harding, who's the director of Round Our Way. Round Our Way is an incredible uh, new organization that is um, uh, that works with, uh, on behalf of, and trying to represent, um, to better represent the views of working class voices in discussions around um, climate change and the environmental crises. Um, he previously worked at uh, Shelter and uh, was the director of the youth, uh, the youth charity Reclaim. So yeah, delighted to welcome you all. Perhaps you want to um, um, uncloak your, your videos. There we go. Um, the big reveal. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, uh, yes, and I should say also Liam, who's joining us from Green Lions. So Liam, um, I was I'm always blown away by Liam's um, bio, and I was reminded this morning the reason for that is that he used to be a lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Sheffield, um, but is one of our um, expert data analysts um, and just incredible uh, source of of of, um, of expertise and um, uh, on on policy, um, particularly on on the energy agenda. So so that's the that's that's the lineup. We'll have an amazing. A conversation, I hope, and I and I hope you feel uh, that you leave uh, this conversation feeling a, a little bit more skilled up on the politics and the policy uh, and what's happening out there when it comes to energy. Um, so yeah, I'll kick off with Lara. So Lara, obviously, um, uh, an eventful 
week or two as ever is that ever not true in 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 British politics but I thought I'd kick off with your thoughts on the latest timing of 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 the election obviously that's that's been the question on everyone's tongues and any any insights you want to share or or or, or when do you think it's going to happen yeah so it's certainly Westminster's favorite parlor game guessing when <laughs> uh, speculating when the election might be we still don't know for certain um we are closer to a broad idea of when it might be because Rishi Sunak uh, ruled out more or less an election uh, that coincides with the local elections at the beginning of May last week um some Tory MPs uh, are still pushing for that but had been hoping uh, that perhaps they could push the prime minister into holding an election that coincides with the locals uh, some of the reasoning being that they felt perhaps the party won't do that well in the local elections and that it would be good to avoid uh, publicity around a drubbing and to hold them at the same time. But Sunak uh, saying in an interview last week with uh, ITV West Country that uh, that date wouldn't really be the case, didn't speculate on uh, wider May dates. But I think the broad assumption that we've heard from number 10 is that we're looking at the autumn um, and I think quite a lot of speculation about when in the autumn that could be. Will it be October? Will it be November? Some saying uh, it could be December to coincide with uh, to be the anniversary of the 2019 uh, general election, for example. And of course, you have to hold it uh, by January 2025. And some uh, even more cynical Westminster observers say, you know, perhaps we might be pushing it all the way until after uh, Christmas of uh, this year. So we'll see. But I think uh, most people's money is on the autumn. There are questions around whether you avoid the party. Conf you have to avoid the party conferences, usually a very big fundraising opportunity for parties. If you hold an election in October, it makes it difficult to see how you will still be able to hold uh, party conferences. But then there are also I've written with my colleague Patrick Maguire in the past about uh, some security warnings that officials had given to ministers around holding an election that coincided with the November presidential election at the beginning of uh, November. So I think there are different questions around uh, when in um, the autumn it might be. But I think fair to say, especially given Rishi Sunak, we now know as of last week is going to be hosting a big uh, summit in July with European leaders. I think it's much more likely that it's in the autumn than anywhere, anytime before now thanks thanks Sarah. that's that's really helpful um and we could we probably should and could run a whole webinar on how the how the u.s election will impact yeah. uh, environmental politics but we'll park that for now um but just on sunak and number 10 of the conservative party obviously an odd weekend of briefing in a way into the into um the telegraph the times the sun uh, elsewhere on on further wobbles in the conservative party particularly the role of the more moderate um, parts of the party kind of um, uh, feeling uh, un unhappy. What what's your take on 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 some of those kind of um, rumbles around a challenge or or more of a sense of instability for for Sunak over the coming months weeks? So yeah, so I think. Um few people have missed the opportunity to say that last week was an extremely difficult week for Rishi Sunak. I think that is a fair observation. It more or less began with the defection of Lee Anderson, former deputy chair to uh, Reform UK, Richard Tice's party. Of course, there was some anger in some conservative quarters about uh, you know, what had led to that and whether or not Rishi Sunak, uh, either in elevating him to that position of deputy chair in the first place or in from the right, not accepting uh, that what he had said about Sadiq Khan, uh, you know, could have a pathway back into the party, for example. There were people on both sides that were upset about how that had been uh, handled. And then moving into uh, the week, I think fair to say some more difficult briefings around whether or not people uh, were getting frustrated about the fact there was no budget bounce in the polls, that that uh, spring budget from Jeremy Hunt, that big national insurance uh, cut hadn't made its way into a boost in support for the Conservative Party in the polls quite yet, uh, who's still, you know, far behind Labour in those polls. So going into the weekend, quite difficult. There was, of course, the big Tory donor row over those comments about Diane Abbott from Frank uh, Hester, who is, of course, the party's biggest uh, donor. There was a lot of anger in Tory quarters about the way that that was handled. Um, and this week, starting off this week, we've, of course, come back from a weekend of, I think, uniquely quite bad briefing for Rishi Sunak, a number of cabinet ministers privately uh, in the Sunday Times yesterday, this morning in the Times, openly questioning whether Rishi Sunak will be leading the party uh, into the next election, some of them seeming sympathetic to uh, the idea that he might not. Um, I think that speaks to 
a lot of uncertainty in conservative in the conservative ranks at the moment about how Rishi Sunak is going to be able to turn what is a very significant and at this point durable Labour lead around in time uh, for an election if that is to be uh, in the autumn. I think this week is a really important week for Rishi Sunak. Uh, and I think we'll find out whether or not he can kind of buy himself some time, so to speak, on this. Um, from the outset, it's worth saying that a challenge is probably quite unlikely, that there are still uh, a big majority of MPs who are, you know, quiet, but do feel, I think, uh, that Rishi Sunak is the person that will lead them into the election and that change leader at this point, late on in the day, um, would be misguided. We saw Ben Wallace, the former Defence Secretary, making that case this morning on Times Radio. But in terms of this week, I think it's important to note that we've got, um, we've only got a week now, a week and one day, I think it is, until Parliament goes on a three-week Easter recess. And that's important because even if MPs are going home to constituencies where they're hearing about the fact the Conservative Party might not be that popular on the doorstep, they're still not in the corridors of Parliament plotting to remove Rishi Sunak. So I think there's a sense in number 10 that they want to get to next Tuesday uh, without a significant challenge to Rishi Sunak. How are they going to do that? Well, Sunak is at a small business conference in Warwickshire uh, today. He's going to be out and about this week trying to, you know, I think there'll be some fighting talk uh, and there'll certainly be the case that, in their view, things are economically turning a corner. On Wednesday, we have inflation news. They'll be hoping that that's positive as well. That's a big part of their message that, you know, stick with us. It's kind of similar to the uh, messages that we've heard from John Major in the past you know, we're turning a corner, you know what it's like with us, etc. Um, and then he's got PMQs on Wednesday. He's also got uh, a big appearance in front of the committee of his Tory backbenchers also on Wednesday. Uh, so there are some key moments this week, I think, where um, he wants to be able to show that he's in control uh, and that he still maintains the authority uh, and the support of his party. So I think after by the end of this week, I think we'll have a pretty good idea of where we are. I also think what Penny Mordaunt, who was at the centre of a lot of his briefing over the weekend, she's the current leader of the Commons. Uh, she's been in former uh, leadership elections in the past. Uh, she has quite a lot of support among some Conservative MPs. And there's the suggestion that some on the right of the party, which is not her natural political home, are now sympathetic to the idea that she might be a successor to Rishi Sunak and before the election even. Now, allies of Penny Mordaunt saying that might be a stitch up to try and discredit her, distancing her from this plot itself. But Mordaunt, I think, an interesting figure because unlike other uh, possible contenders for uh, Rishi Sunak's uh, position in the future, Penny Morden is set to lose her seat if the current polls are to be believed. She's certainly struggling in Portsmouth. Um, and so she might have an incentive where others might not, perhaps, to uh, facilitate some of these uh, some of these ideas that plotters are putting around. But, you know, no suggestion as of that that she is vaguely associated with them or supports them. Uh, but I think an interesting week to watch, interesting to watch her too, um, and certainly one of the most important weeks that Rishi Sunak has had uh, by way of his own authority yet. Thanks, Laura. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Thanks for narrating through what's often a minefield um, and, and hard to know which briefings that we should trust or, or not. Dara, I guess I'll, I, I guess I'll bring you in. Um, I, I guess our sense is sometimes in, um, in Green Alliance with our kind of one foot in Westminster, one foot thinking around the kind of broader um, environmental agenda that that sometimes the conversations can feel a, a little bit removed from the reality of particularly the energy crisis. Obviously, bills are still at double what they were um, a couple of years ago, um, and those fuel poverty rates are kind of um, still still um, edging, well, not even edging, kind of moving quite rapidly upwards. Be interested in how Energy UK is kind of seeing the election year shape up, and and yeah, your 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 take I, I suppose on 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 some of the I guess what feels like a disconnect often thanks Chris I think um thanks so much for the generous introduction as well Chris I think that the <laughs> um at Energy UK what we do that's quite unique I think is we look at both supply and demand so you know we're talking about the impact that um the economy politics world and um, it reflects on our members which includes generators all types of generators um offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, gas, nuclear, um, and also on suppliers, the, the, the companies who are involved in billing and, and giving service and su supply to customers, as well as lots of businesses that are sort of in that new interesting space, including things like EV smart chargers or heat pumps, that sort of thing. So we try and look right across the industry. And I think the first thing that's really important to note is that, you know, we really have made quite a lot of progress decarbonising the UK economy and decoupling emissions from economic growth. 
I mean, we've seen a 53% reduction in emissions since 1990, and the government's not wrong to celebrate that. The economy's grown by 80% in that time. Coal was only about 1% last year compared to 40% in 2013. Yeah, that's right that the UK does celebrate success in that in that space. Um, gas was the largest fuel source in 2023, but our use of gas was the lowest it's ever been since 2015. So, you know, all signs are that we're moving in the direction, the right direction, but... You know, to your point, you're right. The gas crisis did show that the impact economy wide um, of what happens when we get energy policy wrong is significant. So in um, sort of autumn 2021, if I take us back to that whole price, wholesale prices dramatically began to increase and companies started to get out of business. But what happened was, you know, when as soon as customers began to feel that on their bills, it was horrendous and it had an economy-wide impact and government ended up spending over 40 billion pounds to get the right support to households and businesses and it was the right thing to do but what's also right is to not lose sight of that and not to take action now um to ensure it doesn't happen again would be would be silly for any for any government so it's really important that we learn the lessons that we're investing in home homegrown clean decarbonized energy production so we're not reliant on that sort of international price i think you know just if we unpack it a little bit we think about for business um what the crisis really highlighted was how fundamentally important energy is to everything in the economy whether we're talking about high high intensive high energy use activities manufacturing steel making chemicals data centers to those sort of like you know smaller businesses pubs care homes you know everyone was impacted by high prices um and it does have a significant impact on everything. So the price of tomatoes increased by almost 40% in two years. And that's primarily been driven by energy costs, which have increased by over 200% for growers. So, you know, that really does have an impact. And then for households, customers, citizens, and importantly, for this conversation, at least, voters, the crisis highlighted the, co the cost of energy just drives prices right through the economy. You go back to tomatoes, you continue to feel the pinch with your weekly supermarket shop and food inflation. You know, I, I think probably everyone listening to this um, webinar has had a conversation about the cost of their supermarket shop in the last few weeks. I guarantee it because the number of those conversations I end up in, um, it really impacts on people. And it's kind of the, it's about the long tail. Right. And Citizens Advice um, recently said over five million people are living in homes with an energy debt. And we're seeing that with our energy supplier businesses as well. They're doing everything they can to support their customers. But the reality is the cost of living crisis is ongoing and very deep for far too many people. Um, and that, that sets the context for the next election. And today, Public First put out some um, new research where they're basically saying, you know, this is a much harder hill for whoever wins the election because we're going to have lower growth higher inflation worse public finances than we had in 97 and pub the public um are expecting the economy to get worse not better and so the next government is going to have a real challenge on that hearts and minds and also impact but and i will say that i think there is there is potential for optimism here because energy is crucial for the next decade right we need to continue reducing emissions. We need to achieve our energy net zero targets. The private sector will deliver the vast majority of the funding, but it can't do it alone. And it does need government as a partner. So to your question around where is the energy industry? What do we think about this? I think net zero is a global opportunity. Lara rightly pointed out, you know, she, she mentioned the US elections. It is the US, but it's also right across Europe and further afield. There are crucial elections happening and net zero continues to be seen as a wedge issue, not just in the UK, right across the globe. So, you know, I think there is something around talking about net zero because we as the industry really see it as a global economic opportunity. We really do. And I think that, you know, what makes the UK more competitive for lower bills for businesses, more secure heating, warmer homes, less of an impact on the NHS, local authorities, new homes for the future. There's a great story to tell if we invest now and unlock all that potential private sector money, because there's we operate global, globally. Capital has a choice of location. So for the next government, I think what we really want to see is ambition and partnership. And that's what the industry message is, is that we could do this with you. There are things government has to do, which could unlock huge potential from industry and the economy and the climate are really interlinked. So that's the kind of main message, I think, from industry on this election. Uh, thanks, Dara. Um, that's um, 
a really helpful overview and a nice bit of optimism and hope as well. <laughs> so thanks for bringing a bit of that. Um, I've got some questions that I'll that I'd, I'd like to come back to you with, but I'll I'll do it once with um I brought in Roger as well. So yeah yeah Roger, I guess just picking up on the tomatoes kind of food shop point um that Dara kind of helpfully brought in there. What what's your sense from your work of of how the conversation I suppose around energy and climate and environment is kind of playing out in some of those um or um target like segments I suppose of, of the population for for the political parties what's your yeah uh, uh, what's your sense of, of where people are yeah as you say Chris that leads on really nicely what Dara was saying and the and I think like that this issue isn't talked about more is a sort of failure of storytelling on some of this that I'll come back to because I think climate sits behind a lot of it's sort of there as an issue in the election but it also sits behind a lot of issues as well I think because just overall I mean you know as you'll know like climate has gradually been like going up the list of top five issues over the last five years and the sort of conversation about sort of top five issues politically hasn't really caught up with that and I think part of that is because if you ask a politician or some people in the media to sort of close their eyes and picture someone who cares about climate change they're not necessarily picturing the kinds of people that we're working with around our way which is older working class people who are paying the price for uh, climate in one way or another and as you say that's what round our way focuses on and that's been my sort of personal way into climate change of spent most of my career working and supporting people on low incomes and seeing you know driven by personal experience growing up and driven and seeing how climate change is really starting to cause a lot of that bite on people with the cost of living um so uh, you know turning to sort of election sort of key election segments and so on like just briefly just on the sort of the blue wall the sort of southern seats i mean this isn't a big focus around our way but it's uh I think it's briefly worth touching on, like particularly because More in Common had some research out this morning showing that the Conservatives, by their current polling, are facing a, a 15 percentage point swing away from them to Labour that could really make an enormous difference in the election if that was to come to pass. And, you know, part of the driver of that, they, they noted in their research, is that for sort of older Liberal voters, the Conservative Party is being seen as a nasty party again. And I think climate change has an important role in shaping the brand of political parties. Like when I was speaking to some folks working in Spain and like just I, I was speaking to a Spanish pollster curious about what happened in Spain and why Vox, the sort of right populist party, hadn't done better in those elections, despite the fact it was sort of widely seen as going to be a breakthrough moment for them. Um, one of the things the pollster talked about is, look, you know, climate change did not come up as a top issue in the Spanish election, but their perspective on climate change, their perspective on women's rights and their perspective on LGBT rights really shaped the brand of the, the, the Vox brand and meant that some people just didn't go there who might otherwise have gone towards Vox on it. And I think that's worth bearing in mind about what climate change does to parties' brands. But in the sort of, in more working class communities where we work and the people we're trying to support and help, you know, uh, support the campaigns of, um, you know, climate climate change is a slightly bigger issue than I think a lot of people realise. Like, you know, Redfield and Winton, like, polling shows that it's up there with housing and crime in the Red Wall. And I don't think our sort of narrative about Red Wall areas would say that that's the case. And I think we need to all reflect on the sort of storytelling we need to do to make sure that that happens. Because Zara says it's, it sits behind an awful lot of issues. So, like, we did some work with the Day Express recently highlighting the impact of climate change together with ECIU on the impact that climate change is having on people's rising food bills um, that people are seeing consistently. And we would, you know, whether that's because of energy prices at home, whether that's because of droughts on the continent, or whether that's even further afield, like we were doing some stuff on the reasons behind chocolate prices uh, spiking. Like, a big issue for people is their rising energy bills. Like we know that they are higher because as a country we've failed to move towards sustainable energy. Um, we have done a lot of work with some of the tabloids and ITV on flooding. Not a big issue for everyone, but for the people and places where it is a big issue, it's an enormous issue, quite rightly, because it's devastating uh, in its impact. And I think MPs at a constituency level are seeing much more of that, but it's not necessarily in the public imagination at the moment linked to climate change in the way that we 
know that it is. Um, and we've even done some work with uh, with the Times, but also with the BBC on um, the increase in the number of potholes. Um, the wetter our weather is uh, due to climate change, the more that that is driving up the number of potholes, um, as well as the cuts to council funding as well. So I think climate change sits there behind a lot of the conversation in the election, even if it's not the sort of term that people would mention. And so I think for people working on climate change, I think there's sort of two failures of storytelling there. One to sort of change that mind's eye perception of who it is people think about when they think about someone who cares about climate change. And at the moment they think of a sort of climate activist and actually increasingly it's the people that Round Away and others are working with who are really at the sharp end of the rising cost of living um, that has been driven by climate. Um, and the other thing is making those links um, that, you know, climate change and the energy crisis does sit behind rising food bills, does sit behind um, uh, flooding, does sit behind energy bills, does sit behind even things like the rising uh, number of potholes. And I think it, like, hopefully our work shows that you can tell a much more engaging and compelling story on this, but we've got to, like, start centering the experiences of the people at the sharp end of this um and that's what will yeah change public opinion i mean that uh, you know even more so over the next few years climate change really does tick up even more so into the sort of like starts to vie with cost of living in the nhs as one of those sort of top two issues that constantly gets mentioned on the doorstep yeah thanks roger that's that's really neatly like tied together i think a lot of um the conversation so far I guess I'll open it out to everyone, but perhaps Lara, you might want to come in on this this first. I guess picking up on kind of Roger's point and Dara's point around um, the reality, I suppose, of some of what lies behind a climate policy, um, and you know the kind of in many ways like centrality of of a lot of that to both the economy and in terms of industry and energy. But also the knock-on impacts then upon everyday lives. I, I guess I'd be interested in how you see the conversation around climate playing out in the election um, in 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 Westminster, and and to what extent you you think it's possible that that or or that there's a kind of hope that some of that might become, for want of a better word, I, I don't know whether sensible is the right word or kind of like engaged in some of the substance. When often it feels like I I suppose it it's the kind of these flashpoint issues that 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 sometimes kind of dominate the conversation but but yeah I, I suppose broadly just how you seeing it how you see it playing out and and um yeah will it be an issue in 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 a big way yeah it's a really interesting question um I think clearly it's something that uh lots of people care very deeply about and uh for that reason I can't imagine that it will be absent the election but um I do think there was a sense last September when Rishi Sunak gave that speech on net zero priorities saying we're going to be doing it a different way and in doing so uh watering down some of the key uh pledges uh that that, that was Sunak intending to kind of make this an issue that would be central to the party's um, election campaign. Uh, it would be something that they'd want to talk, uh, you know, to Labour about and that we'd be hearing lots more about them from. And I'm not necessarily sure that we actually have done subsequently. I think the priorities um, in terms of what they want to, you know, use as a wedge issue with, with Labour uh, haven't necessarily been that climate focused. I mean, I, part of the reason for that also is that uh, Labour aren't, walking into that in the way that you might have, you know, a few years ago expected them to. But the Conservatives, for example, last week talking about new gas power, um, it was very interesting to see that, you know, Labour said we, we're supporting the plan. Claire Coutinho, um, the Energy Secretary, had, of course, said, you know, if it's a choice between heating our homes or otherwise, the Conservatives are going to choose heating our homes. Uh, I think some people, some uh, Tory aides had expected that uh, Labour would come out and criticise that move, but actually said, you know, this is this actually is a sensible move that's part of decarbonisation and, and we support it. And as such, it didn't become a political row. That was yeah. something that there was consensus on between them. And I actually think, um, you know, we don't hear so much of those issues because they don't garner the, atten the attention of you know headlines and etc but I think you could see it actually not being uh, an issue that is massively partisan uh, come the election but we'll see and certainly it's something that 
Keir has spoken about, uh, have spoken about previously, and we heard him speak about this issue in his conference speech. So it's not, you know, it's not like we're absent this. And Ed Miliband, um, you know, certainly a very high, one of the most high profile figures in the shadow cabinet who has this brief. So I don't want to suggest that it's not going to be a very important issue uh, that both parties talk about come the election. But I, I don't necessarily think it's going to be one of these kind of so-called wedge issues that we talk about in Westminster, where there's a massively different uh, position of the two parties uh, and that one party is trying to kind of win over the other necessarily. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, also, just a quick shout out, if you want to ask any questions, please do put them in the Q&A and I, and I will monitor that. Um, in the absence, then I get to ask all my questions, which is obviously a dream scenario for me, but please do put yours in the chat. I guess just picking up on that point and kind of uh, Roger, Dara, interested in, in, in your views as well on, on Labour specifically. I mean, I think there was two ways of reading the 28 billion uh, decision one you know it was a decision made purely on electoral strategy and the substance it as it were um was you know not particularly you know it it, it could have equally been on the nhs or on education um and um it was it was an attack line you know driven by a large number um and they wanted to kill it off and i i guess they they um those pushing that, I, I I think think they've successfully done so. Um, and the other one is, you know, that it was a, and perhaps both can be true, that it was a significant, you know, rollback of 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 capital spend to um to uh you know an important agenda um uh, uh with that will have meaningful impacts upon their ability to deliver in government. And 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 I suppose, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in how you how you kind of see that decision and well, well I guess Dara specifically on kind of yeah kind of any yeah, your take I suppose on on how it landed um but also on some of the politics of of, of how Labour is kind of thinking about th 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 this issue and, and Roger I suppose it speaks to your point are we are they storytelling effectively as well so so but yeah uh, uh, Dara oh, so I think I think for me it's sort of um the the reality is the 28 billion pledge was made uh, you know in in different economic circumstances really um the there is i think a more important um point around signaling what we as an industry have been saying to government and very publicly over the last few years has been that you know decarbonizing the uk has generated nearly 55 billion pounds in annual turnover it's employed nearly 250,000 new new in create new jobs um but because of what we've seen in the last 18 months two years there has been so much um uncertainty there's been so much chopping and changing and there's been so many shifts in direction and emphasis that we um haven't had the certainty as an industry on direction of travel. And what that means is that investors don't have certainty. And if you look at, again, looking globally, and I said already, you know, capital has a choice of location, and that is the reality. When I mean, you've got, you can't have a webinar without talking about the Inflation Reduction Act in America, <laughs> but it's also repowering EU. It's about everything happening in, in India, in China, the investments in offshore wind, the investments in solar energy. Um, investors who invest in the UK more often than not also invest globally and right now I think the UK is due to be bottom of the eight largest economies in terms of forecast growth in low carbon sectors um, and that has a significance right across the country so like a good example is the southwest and the west midlands areas that have like GDP I think below national average they could be two of the biggest beneficiaries on the transition to net zero because they've got really specialist manufacturing sectors, um, which does speak to Roger's point about storytelling. But more, more importantly, I think it's about if you have a consistent direction of travel, if you are you know, not constantly shifting the sands and, and changing the parameters, you'll attract more investment. That in turn unlocks you know, growth, productivity, jobs. And the challenge, I think, is, is quite clear because of that international um, comparator. And I think, you know, we have had um, a really difficult time 
with things like the contracts for difference with the le- the last auction round not delivering any offshore wind and we've got really ambitious offshore wind targets which are achievable but it makes it even harder next time so that's a really good example of where we need consistency direction of travel from um this government and the next 28 billion but i did want to um also comment on your sort of point around september and that sort of the intervention from the prime minister and i think the prime minister's right i don't think that we have um had that conversation with the public around net zero and what it means um and the cost of it but not just the cost the experience you know we're going to have to do quite a lot to people's homes in the next 10 15 20 years we're going to have to improve the energy efficiency we're going to have to decarbonize heat around 80 percent of homes are on gas for central heating right now and we're going to have to get our homes ready so that they are smart and that they can respond to price signals so that when energy is cheapest and most plentiful on the grid you are getting it for a really good price you know and it's in your your pet you're kind of able to respond to it um and i don't think people really know that and actually it's quite an exciting future um but it will not be painless like we do have to make changes to our homes we've got really old leaky housing in the uk so i agree that we should have the conversation i disagree that it's about having seven bins right i think it's about how do we support people to to do it well Uh, thanks dara and 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 and, and laura just on the just on the labor point um yeah obviously they, they did have a rough couple of weeks with I guess with the 28 billion that that did rumble on for quite a long time with everyone kind of writing that story um they're gonna drop it they're gonna drop it um no they're really gonna drop it um and then they did drop it and I guess that coincided with a few of those by-elections as well and you know particularly the the Rochdale by-election which which went quite badly for them is is your sense that they've kind of re-stabilize the, the the ship slightly after that or are some of those reverberations still kind of kind of playing out i guess they had a public row about, about at the 28 um which i guess for, for a lot of people as as dara pointed to around certainty didn't necessarily look that good yeah it certainly felt with the 28 billion in particular like some of the concerns with the MPs that i spoke to were more around what it said about the difficulty in messaging there and political communication that it wasn't necessarily about the substance of the new package that we then saw, which broadly, when I spoke to MPs, they were supportive of, they understood that the fiscal situation had changed and that something like that was going to be on the horizon. I think the difficulty was actually in how that was handled uh, internally and by way of communication too. So I think that was why it was uh, rocky. I think it's fair to say, you know, the party seems to have moved past that now, or at least you don't see a great deal of uh, briefing that's still focused on that. But I think you're right to mention Rochdale, which was very difficult uh, for the party, you know, Keir Starmer himself acknowledging um, the party's role in that whole, you know, saga that we saw uh, and expressing kind of deep regret on the day of the election, too. So uh, I think going forward, there'll definitely be a focus on um, the communication with regards to that, too. But I think last week, uh, in some senses, Keir Starmer will have probably been relieved that the focus was more on the Conservative Party um, on account of the Frank Hester Tory donor row than it necessarily was uh, on then. But we'll see how politics goes this week. Yeah, thanks, Laura. And Roger, did, did you want to jump in on the on the storytelling? Yeah. Point? Well, and also just on the, the, the Labour side as well, like I think the, you know, one of the things that remains in his core is that there is a really ambitious mission um on climate uh that Kistam has set out and I think it's sort of it'll be really important for those working on climate change to make sure that that really does become transformative both in terms of its delivery but also in terms of how that delivery is done um and you know the it's been some interesting briefing to the times and elsewhere about how the labor leadership is thinking quite seriously about rewiring government to make that deliverable and i think that's a potentially really interesting and exciting opportunity if a future government does that and like one organization i'm involved in the future governance forum has been doing some interesting work about yeah what that would look like in government i think um i think for sort of climate just the a couple of points on sort of this on the storytelling bit i think for climate campaigners there can be a slight danger of obsessing about the language of climate change and also starting where you are and then hoping to get to the public or get the public closer to you like if you want to make the case for more sustainable energy there has never been a better public opinion environment on it it is cost of living is the top issue 
that people raise on the doorstep if you speak to anyone who's doing canvassing for any party uh, at the moment and there is a lot of public support for the country having better energy security and cheaper energy bills and that doesn't need to mention climate change to like bring about some really positive climate related uh policy and so i sort of caution people about obsessing too much about whether their word gets a mention in it the important thing is whether the policy is backed and the environment on that issue is fantastic at the moment um and then I, uh, also just to pick up uh does really important point about storytelling in government like a lot of the decarbonization in the uk as you were mentioning, has basically been on the sort of industrial back end of things, particularly in our energy sector, and it's increasingly not going to be. It is increasingly going to be very much in people's homes and lives very directly um, in the coming years. And so I think whoever that forms the next government, it is going to be really important not just to think about having good policy, but to think about having excellent communication about how you talk about that policy like ensuring it is fair to people on lower incomes and then ensuring it is communicated to people like you know particularly with some of the folks that we're working with in old as you say drafty social housing or ex-council housing like some of that is going to need a lot of work in terms of insulation and getting off of gas boilers and all the rest of it and yeah people are going to be really protective of a home yeah. That they love and so i think that's just going to need some really deft and important communications and so therefore i hope whichever government comes next is one that is thinking about that communications piece as well alongside the policy bit as well yeah thanks roger such an important but such an important point both on kind of remembering that that climate is i, I suppose um well it is you know one of those kind of five driving missions of the of the labor party at the moment and and yeah, the importance of the communication point and, and i think that's so true we sometimes do get lost in our own little bubble around you know a big tons of co2 and and um uh and decarbonization pathways and we kind of forget a little bit that there's uh lots of people who need to um feel uh that uh, their lives are improving just on the missions point then liam thanks for waiting so patiently um uh and um uh yeah um I guess yeah, it'd be it'd be great to hear a little bit around um, yeah, where 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 we see I, I suppose where Green Alliance sees the kind of missing bit of that mission um, and um, yeah, I, I guess picking up on on Roger's point as well around kind of how it's not just about the policy substance, but around how you actually do it in government and and um, that's you know as well not, maybe not as big a question but it's a big question isn't it so yeah but uh, Aliam, do you want to talk us a bit around how green lights is thinking about that stuff yeah thanks chris and, and thanks everyone so far it's um, just to say i totally agree with everything that's been said already and i think i do think that storytelling piece is is critical tied up with as well dara's point about giving clarity um, and giving certainty because even you know i think dara you were speaking mostly to, to business and investors there but but we as consumers and citizens want certainty as well. We want to know if we're thinking about upgrading our home or um, switching our car or our um, our heating system, what is going to be the choice of the future? And if the government's still sort of dilly-dallying around different options and and refusing to sign up to sort of, you know, pick pick the winner and, and leave us with with a choice, nobody wants to pick the wrong horse, right? So they're, they're, it's hard for people to, to move forward as well. And I do think people... We'll want to come on the journey, but we need to tell that story about why it's going to be better um, and um, and more enjoyable when we get there, and 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 that we'll support each other through it. So, to, to, to totally agree on all of that. Um, in terms of the policy and and some of the thinking we've been doing at, at Green Alliance, um, what I would really love to see from from all the parties when they're talking about, um, you know, their plans for the next parliament and their plans for how to bring down bills for um, consumers and how to make our energy and, and power system more secure is is exactly that what will they do on, on this um on this point and how will they kind of pull out all the stops to transform the electricity system into one that is cheap and is secure and is clean um and i think it, like lara mentioned it earlier i think it was more politics in the end than policy but the, the announcement last week about um, new gas power stations um needing to be built to, to keep the lights on um, I think that really does illustrate this point that we've been thinking about, which is that the build out of renewables is going OK. Yeah, we've had some bumps and, and we do need to go faster, but it's happening. 
Um, but we haven't seen the, the build out and the rollout really of the other piece of the puzzle when it comes to clean electricity and that's clean, flexible power. And that can come in different forms. It can come uh, in terms of demand flexibility. So that may look like um, EVs, vehicle to grid, charging and discharging back into the grid at some point, which could be an extremely cheap way of providing that flexibility. But it will also be different forms of energy storage and long duration energy storage. And it may also look like something like hydrogen power as well. So replacing that gas with hydrogen, which is uh, generally cleaner. Um, the question is, how are we going to build enough of those things and, and roll out enough of those things to make sure that we get ourselves off the gas uh, as quickly as possible so that it's not um, driving power prices or, or um, creating these spikes in, in prices. So at Green Alliance, we've argued in favor of a clean flexibility task force, a little bit like the vaccine task force that we saw um, during COVID, which is kind of laser focused on getting some of these things um, over the line and, and built uh, as soon as possible. There are, uh, the government is sort of developing some support schemes, for some of these different technologies, but none of those will guarantee that those things get built. Um, without something like a, a dedicated task force. So that's what we're asking for, really, something that works alongside the industry to break down some of the barriers and, and obstacles, a bit like a venture capital fund might do, uh, and, and different to um, maybe previous government um, units that are perhaps a bit more focused on compliance and checking your KPIs, et cetera, et cetera, but just working together um, to, to move things forward. Last thing I'll say is that some of that might need some money behind it. There will be some assets that actually look like really, really sensible investments for a state to make um, in return for maybe some share of equity. And a, a great example is pumped hydropower, which has quite long build times and then very, very long lifetimes. Not the kind of things that typical investors are likely to, to get behind because of that sort of long story, but it is something that the state um, could then benefit from for, for a long time. So. Um, could be quite quite attractive. And there'll be other assets which don't need state intervention or partnership or investment, but they just need that commitment from government to support building out a certain amount of capacity and um, and making sure that, that things get going. So I think that's how we reduce the need to build new gas power stations in the first place um, and also secure the system against external shocks. So I hope the next government will introduce something like uh, a clean flexibility task force for our energy sector. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. That's that's um, yeah, that's such a useful um insight, and and I guess also shows shows the different levels that um the environmental community kind of needs to operate on in a way. Um, both some of that deeply technical, but kind of central, uh, like policy work that needs to be done. Uh, whoever wins the next election, and and also this the the kind of broad importance as you say of, of and as everyone said of, of of storytelling um there's a few questions but i think they kind of slightly all speak to one point so i'll probably just uh, end a little bit by asking everyone to reflect on on that and i'll start with you lara because i know you have to jump off fairly imminently um but yeah the questions are kind of revolved around um yeah the issue I, I guess the nature of net zero climate becoming a wedge issue around um how how to communicate effectively. Um, it feels like a lot of the questions are there, which is just so interesting given that so much of our time often is spent on policy or on politics. But but yeah, I, I guess I, I'll frame the question. I hope this is okay, everyone who asked um, in, with Chair's Liberty as, as what advice would you give the environmental community? And, and I define that broadly as people um, which I'd probably assume as all of us who want to see action taken. I, th I think we're all invested in that um, in this election year. How, how, how should we be engaging in the election? How should we be communicating? Um, and, and that's a broad question, I know, Lara, but, but uh, take it as you want to take it. What advice would you give, you know, uh, people trying to operate in, in this space? Yeah, um, I think very broadly, just to keep talking about it, I think um, well, I my experience of Westminster has actually been that 
politicians are uh, more receptive to communication from constituents and uh, people that they meet at events and on the road um, than I think some people give them credit for. And that actually uh, directly speaking to your representative about the issues that you care about doesn't sound like an original point from me, but uh, I maintain that actually it's a it's a it's a really important and uh, and actually valuable way of, uh, of reaching your representatives and changing minds and views. So that's my advice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, Dara. I think um, speaking to people from the sort of environmental NGO and the green movement, uh, the, the kind of main messages, I think, for me is that there's there's now, you know, we're now in a space where that sort of dividing line between social policy to do with people and experience and environmental policy to do with nature um, is actually completely blurred. And that's absolutely fine. I think we all need to be able to speak um, in a way that kind of gives due regard to the different competing needs and necessities right across those barriers. The reality is, is that actually bills are expensive. We're in a cost of living crisis, but we also have this huge climate emergency that we need to tackle. Um, from an industry point of view, you know, we have solutions. We're keen to invest the money. What we need is consistency and a sensible approach from government that doesn't keep changing all the time. So kind of consistency and ambition from the next government is what we're looking for. Yeah, thanks, Dara. Uh, Roger. On the um, wedge issue question, the uh, I'd be nervous about it being a wedge issue um, in of itself. Like I want ambition on this to become a sort of dividing line as it has been on you know, different parties' ambitions for the NHS or their ambitions around house building uh, in the past. Um, but I think yeah, the, an awful lot needs to happen, as other people on this call who are much more expert on it than me, needs to happen between now and 2050 at least. And I don't think you're gonna that's going to be achieved if basically in a two-party system, you're going to go through long periods of one party not wanting to do anything um, on this. Um, and in terms of um, the communications bit of it i think just a couple of brief things on it one just like amongst the climate movement i think we need to think about who are the best spokespeople for some of this and like what we're trying to do it around our way is like some of the best spokespeople are people themselves so you know we are constantly trying to platform um people who in one way or another are paying the price for our climate inaction uh, in the UK for my class communities, and they are the best communicators to their neighbours, bluntly. Um, and so we need to do um, much more of that. And as I say, I think we just need to start with where people are on this. Um, to Back when I worked at Reclaim as a youth working class uh, campaigning charity, um, it was during when the sort of Fridays for the Future and all that sort of stuff was kicking off. And so lots of people were talking to me about, like, you must be doing tons of campaigning on climate change, given you work with young people uh, all the time. And I was like, to be honest, we're not doing any. Um, like, it just does not come up as one of the main issues. Um, but I got asked about it enough that I spoke to some of the young people there about why that was the case. And, then we, you know, the main thing that came back to them was just like, it was it felt like a longer term horizon issue than their horizon. Their horizon was basically like supporting their parents to get to the end of the month and climate change just didn't figure um, in that. And no amount of clever comms is going to get you out of that conundrum for someone who's really hard pressed. You're going to have to have a conversation with them about the one conversation they want to have. Um, so yeah, start with where people are on this stuff. Thanks, Roger. That's um, really powerful advice. Thank you. Um, Liam, any final words? No, just, just again to agree and reflect on on everyone's points, and I think uh, for me that storytelling feels r really key. And and like Roger said, you've got to take people with you on that journey, or or go with them on their journey in a sense. Um, but you know the the future that we're talking about is 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 healthier. Um, it's a thriving society in a safe climate with warm homes cheap energy, safe and affordable mobility, healthy food, interesting jobs, and a booming domestic industry. So it's all like, it's all really good stuff. Um, and I'm you know really excited to get there, but we do need everyone to come on that journey. And so I think we've got to get that buy-in and, and I think we'll get that, get there quicker um, if we start there. So yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Liam. Um, cool, well, thank you everyone. Um, thank you, especially to Dara and Roger and Lara, who had to shoot off um, to do her 
midday radio show on times radio um so um yeah but thank you so much for taking the time um i think it was such a rich conversation um it's my first day back from holiday and i feel so like enriched with lots of brilliant thoughts and uh from all of you um so such a nice way to start back we're doing this uh, webinar every month um so if you'd like to partner with us or you found this interesting or yeah then uh, drop us a note we've also done some quick reactive ones when there's a big issue so uh, really keen to keep doing those um, and yeah on the vaccine task force for clean flexible power um, we'll share that in the follow-up but that's a kind of bit of a priority for us um, so um, yeah we'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in in that specifically um, yeah and in the we'll send a little note and include a link to stuff that round our way are doing and um, uh, and Energy UK, so you can kind of follow up if there was any bits you wanted to pick up on. But yeah, thank you again for joining um, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs>